Well, I want to welcome you in. If you are new with us, my name is Clayton. I'm the lead pastor here at Meta Church, and I'm so glad that you joined us. Last week, we talked about the power and the importance of living a life of love. If you missed last week or any of the uh, weeks in the past, you can catch up very easily on our YouTube channel. That's metachurch.com. Or, no, 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 youtube.com slash metachurch. This week, we are going to talk about one of the simplest ways that you can express that love to those around you. My message today is called The Great Invite. The Great Invite. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your great love for us. And uh, Holy Spirit, we know that you're here, that you are wanting to, to speak to us, to give us something new, to give us something fresh. And so I pray that whether we have been believers for a very long time or whether we are here or streaming online, maybe we're on the fence or skeptical, we would just humble ourselves in this moment and seek you. And I believe that you will speak to us. We love you. And I pray that you guide this time and we ask it all in Jesus' name. And if you're ready to get going, say amen. Amen. Today, we're going to be in Luke's gospel. This is one of the historical accounts of the life of Jesus. And to give you a little bit of context about Luke chapter 14, Jesus has been invited to a meal with a group of Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were the religious leaders at that time, and they did not like Jesus. They saw him as a threat to their power and to their position, and they were always butting heads with Jesus. And so here they are inviting him to recline and have a meal. And th this isn't like out of the kindness of their heart. This is not an olive branch. This is kind of so they can feel him out and keep an eye on him. But this is that whole idea of keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Okay, so y'all know how to act like Pharisees. I love that. That's so good. Um, <laughs> So that's what the Pharisees are doing, and as soon as Jesus sits down, you need to know some things about Jesus, because a lot of us, we like the characteristic of Jesus where he is so kind. Don't we love the kindness of the Lord? And we should, and that is a part of his character. And we like the parts, like, uh, when I think about the kindness of Jesus, I think about that one moment where there's a group of small kids, and they're wanting to come and hang out with Jesus, but Jesus is teaching all of the adults, and so some of the adults are like, hey, you know, sit down and shut up, or whatever, and Jesus is like, let the little children cometh unto me. That's how they talked back then, you know? And it's just like, man, he's just so kind, you know? But if you read the Gospels, and you should be reading Scripture, Jesus is also very direct when people are wrong. And when people are wrong and manipulative and abusing their power, Jesus can be straight up savage. And so he's invited into this meal, and he sits down and just goes in. He starts talking to them about all of these habits that they have and preaching against it. Like one of the things that they would do is they would always make sure that they were invited to all of the social events. And they would leverage their power and position to make sure that they were on the list. And so they'd get invited to all these big fancy banquets. And then once they got to the banquet, they would kind of jockey for position because it was an honor-shame culture. And the closer you were to the head of the table, the more honor you received. And so they would try to manipulate their way to the head of the table. And Jesus just starts going in. Like you shouldn't be doing this. And you shouldn't be fighting for position. And you should give up your seat for others. And you should actually humble yourself. And they're just not getting it. In Luke 14, 12, Jesus also said to the one who had invited him, I'm telling you, savage, uh, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends. That's what he just did. Don't invite your brothers or sisters, your relatives, your rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. Now, that's an interesting teaching in the ancient world because they're all thinking, that's exactly why I invited these people. I invited them so they'd pay me back. I invited them so they would then invite me to something else. On the contrary, Jesus said, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, in just these three verses, there's a lot of important context. First, you need to know this because the whole metaphor today is going to be about a banquet. Um, being invited to a dinner would have been the highlight of your week. Being invited to a banquet would have been the highlight of your year. And depending on who threw the banquet, it might be the highlight of your entire life. You would tell the story of this banquet 
forever. And we have to try and put ourselves in the cultural context to understand how big of a deal this was. This was 2,000 years ago, which means there was almost no entertainment. And 2,000 years ago, when the sun went down, guess what it was? Dark, right? There was no electricity. There were no lights. To have any illumination, you had to burn oil, and the oil was expensive. And if you were like 97% of the people alive in the ancient world, you were poor, and you would never burn your oil just to play some games or have some excitement in your life. And so you worked, because by the time you were 12 or 13, you were working, and you would work until about 30 minutes until the sun went down. And then the sun went down, and it was just dark and boring. And so you went to bed. Nothing exciting ever happened. And I was thinking about how overstimulated and over-entertained we are. You could pick a lot of spots like this here in our city in San Antonio. But I was thinking about that one area right by 10 and 1604 at the rim. And I thought you could park in one parking spot and never move your car. And you could spend an entire day. And for a few hours, you could go to Andretti and race go-karts up a three-story track. Then you could walk next door and you go to Top Golf and drive golf balls off the fourth story while drinking mimosas and eating the world's best tater tots. Then you could get down and walk and go skydiving indoors in I fly and that's your whole day and then you would go home and your kids would complain that you haven't cooked a good enough meal for them you know like we're so overstimulated and we have so much entertainment and in the world back then there was just nothing you didn't go bowling with your friends in the evening you didn't stream and binge the latest show it was just dark and boring and everything was hard so if you wanted food guess what you had to work really freaking hard to get that food if you wanted fruits and veggies, you had to plant them, then water them, and then you just had to wait forever, and then you had to go pick them, right? Like all of them before they went bad on the vine. And it was hot and sweaty work just to eat some grapes. And if you wanted protein, at minimum, you had to go to the market and buy almost the whole animal, and then butcher it yourself, and then cook it yourself, and you didn't have an oven. And if you didn't have a market because you lived in a more rural area, you would have to go kill that animal, and then gut that animal. Then you would have to butcher it. Then you would have to cook it. Just getting a meal on the table was so difficult. No H-E-B. Here, everything sucks, right? It's just hard all the time. And so a banquet was like a huge party. And depending on who threw it, it might last two, three, four days. And there was often live music. And there was a huge spread of food. It was free wine. Some of y'all are interested, right, in the banquet now. And you would show up, and there would be protein, and you didn't have to do anything but just walk up. And just, y'all didn't know you were going to watch me eat today. And you'd just be blown away, like, I didn't have to cook this. You walk over, grapes. Mm. Didn't have to do anything. It's just, if you're an ancient person, just having to do this, and now there's a grape in your life, that's crazy, right? I was thinking like um, every once in a while, some of us in San Antonio, not me, but maybe you, end up like with really, really amazing sweet seats at the Spurs game. You know, like your, your cousins, brothers, uncles, friend, like had a thing, right? And owed you one. And then you had amazing seats. And then this is what I've heard. I haven't done it, but this is what I've heard. You have the amazing seat. And then whenever you want, you get to walk through the tunnel, right? <laughs> You're in the tunnel with the spurs, you know? And then in that tunnel, this is what I've heard, free food. If that happens to me, I'm going to tell that story to my grandchildren's children, okay? That's like going to a banquet in the ancient world. It is the biggest deal. And the ancient world worked on a concept called reciprocation, which means I scratch your back, you scratch mine. And so a banquet might cost a year or two's salary. It was a huge cost. But if I can get 50 people or 100 people or 150 people to my banquet, I'm set up for the next five years. Every couple weekends, I'm going to be invited in. I brought you to mine, so you bring me to yours, and that's the way it works. I honored you, and so you give me honor. I did all the work, and now I get something for it. And Jesus just completely explodes this idea. He says, on the contrary, when you host a banquet, a life-changing event, invite those who are poor, 
maimed, lame, or blind. Now remember, Jesus is with the Pharisees. They know the scriptures inside and out. And so he says something with deep theological significance. He says, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. We talk all the time at MetaChurch about having a pilgrim's perspective. It's one of our seven values for how we live here. A pilgrim's perspective means every day trying to broaden your perspective to the highest possible point where you keep eternity in view. And what happens when you keep eternity in view is you realize this life is not your home, that you are just a pilgrim passing through. Your realist reality is on the other side of this life when you spend your eternal life with God. The resurrection of the righteous is when you enter into God's eternal kingdom. Jesus is telling them all of these parables. He's challenging them. He's calling them arrogant and manipulative and saying they have everything upside down. And to the Pharisees, they were right on track. You see, they had bought this lie that the way that you get eternal life is through your works. And of course, they thought that way because everything was based on reciprocation. If I do a lot of good things for God, then God will owe me something good in the end. The Pharisees were so obsessed with following the law that not only did they follow the law of Israel, which is in the Jewish scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, they started adding laws to guide those laws. And then they would get together and add more rules to follow those rules. And then they'd get some new commands to structure those commands. And they just built Burden and burden and more rules and more regulations and more laws into the society, knowing that most people didn't have the luxury of being able to actually follow all of these cumbersome rules. Only the Pharisees who spent all day in the temple could possibly even have a shot. They would parade their goodness and righteousness around. They dressed themselves much differently than the normal everyday person. So just by looking at them, you could see Just how righteous they were. Jesus came to turn everything that they thought about the way God works on its head. And what's so genius about what Jesus is doing is he's doing it through the parable of a banquet. In the Old Testament, a banquet is one of the metaphors that is used. It's very near and dear to the heart of the Jewish people. It's a metaphor for God's eternal kingdom. This thing that they were looking forward to. Now he's really challenging them to change the way that they're living and structuring their life and thinking about themselves and they do not get it. The Pharisees are so lost. As a matter of fact, they're so lost that right after Jesus challenges them and tells them they're doing everything wrong, they prove how much they do not get it by one of them offering up a toast of like, yes, the resurrection of the righteous where us Pharisees will all obviously be there. Verse 15, when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Subtext, blessed is the one, boys, that's us, who will be there at the banquet at the end of time, God's eternal kingdom, eating bread and sitting in eternity with our heavenly father. Now, I told you when Jesus heard bad theology, he would confront it directly and often savagely. And that's what he does with our primary parable that we're going to look at today, the parable of the banquet. In verse 16, Jesus told him a man was giving a large banquet and invited many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to tell those who were invited, come, because everything is now ready. Now, just remember, you got to keep this in your mind because we hear invited to a banquet and most of us think, uh, Boring, right? To them, this was the most exciting thing that could possibly happen to them. They're invited to a banquet. And this is the ancient world. It's brutal. Everything is difficult. Now, a little bit of ancient context. When someone would throw a banquet, there were actually two invitations that would go out. And the first invitation was like the RSVP. And so the master would send a servant out to all of the invited guests, and they would just check in. Hey, my man's throwing a banquet. Would you like to attend? Now, it was basically a rhetorical question because the answer was yes. Now, what if it's your kid's birthday? 
The answers, still yes. What if it's your 10 year wedding anniversary? The answer is still yes. What if you're on your deathbed? The answer is yes. And then you just figure out how to get there, right? Like no one will ever turn down an invitation to a large banquet. And so it's kind of rhetorical, but it's just more like a courtesy. It's letting you know you've been invited. I'm gonna check yes for you on the RSVP. Then you would wait. You see, we live off like Google calendars, where if I'm gonna invite you to something, I'm gonna say it's gonna start at 7.05 p.m., okay? Arrive at 6.55, you know? Like, that's how we operate, not in the ancient world, and still today, not in many Eastern societies. Because it was like this, a banquet's coming, so be ready. And then the master's gotta source the wine. It might be coming from Capernaum. And it's gonna get there whenever the camel gets there, right? And so then you put the banquet together and the second invite comes out. And what did the servant say on the second invite? He goes out to the people and he says, come, everything is now ready. The banquet is at hand. That's how they would say it back then. The banquet is at hand, which meant go take a bath, get some clothes on. It's on. The time has come. Show up. Everybody knew that this is how it worked. However, in the parable that Jesus is telling the Pharisees, the most insane thing happens. In verse 18, but without exception, that means all of them, without exception, they all began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. So I ask you to excuse me. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. So I ask that you excuse me. And another said, I just got married and therefore, I'm unable to come. Now, we don't know how to react to this part of the parable because we are overstimulated and overentertained. But I can almost guarantee you that when Jesus finished this part of the parable, the Pharisees sitting around the table with him were laughing hysterically. He probably couldn't even get that out. The idea that anyone would turn down coming to a banquet, first of all, they already RSVP'd yes, which means they made preparations for them to be there. And now they're going to say no? Oh, that's hysterical. I can imagine the Pharisees like breaking down these excuses and just how stupid they were. He bought a field and he can't come because the field is the field going to get up and walk away. He can't see the field tomorrow. He bought some oxen. They're in a pen. Just wait, bro. See the oxen next week. It's fine. The last one is like Jesus put it in there just to, to throw them over the top. Oh, I just got married. And you know how notoriously women hate being taken on once in a lifetime dates, you know? Like my new wife would much rather labor all day long to make us a modest meal than to come and get this spread, right? It's laughable. No one could believe it. And they're like, Jesus, what kind of story are you telling here? He continues and says, so the servant came back and reported these things to his master. And the master was angry. In the ancient world, wars were started over this kind of disrespect. Checking yes on the RSVP and then saying no the day of. In anger, the master of his house told his servant, go out quickly in the streets and alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, maimed, blind, and lame. Master, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, and there's still room. And the master told the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and make them come in so that my house may be filled. Now, Jesus' story was already wild. Huge banquet, everyone says no to going. It's like an impossible story. And now it gets 10 times crazier. Like number one, no one would turn down a banquet. And then no one throwing a banquet would ever fill it with the outcasts of society. This is a, a culture of reciprocation. You would never invite a bunch of people who cannot give you anything in return. And my guess is that the hysterical laughter of the Pharisees over these excuses turned into deafening silence as they tried to even comprehend what point Jesus could possibly be making. Now, Jesus is getting really close to landing the plane on what this parable actually means, and he starts giving us some hints with the language that he's using. For example, in verse 21, he tells them to go into the city, into the streets and the alleys, to the poor, maimed, blind, and lame, and to bring them here. Now notice, he doesn't say to invite them. 
And the reason that it's stronger language than an invitation is because an invitation never would have worked. We're so far removed from this context that even if we have nothing to give, if someone invites us to a large banquet, we're probably going to be like, I'm there. Can't wait. Save my spot. Back then, if you didn't have something that you could reciprocate, you would never dare show up. And so they go to the poor of the city and say, the wealthiest man is throwing a banquet. He has, he has asked that you show up. They're going to be like, I can't do that. I can't throw a banquet in return. I can't throw a lunch in I can't throw a loaf of bread in return. I have nothing to give this man. I have no clout. I have no status. I have no influence. I have no resources. He doesn't say to invite them. Much stronger. He says, bring them in. In a culture of reciprocation, the first job of the servant is going to be to convince them that this is actually for free. No strings attached. He's just invited you to the table. He really hopes you'll come. Then it gets crazier. In verse 23, the master told the servant, go out, which means outside of the city, into the highways and the hedges, even stronger. Make them come in. Make them come in. This is one Greek word. It's the Greek word anikos. The word means to compel someone, to strongly persuade someone. It's the image of like dropping to your knees and begging someone. You see, the people who were in the city, the poor, the maimed, the blind, the lame, they were in the city. They were stepped over and left behind, but, but they lived inside the city. They were seen as a part of Israel. Many believed that they were cursed by God, maybe because of some sin in their life, or maybe even some sin in the lives of their family. People had bought the lie that we have a reciprocal God. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. At least they were in the city, though, you know? People would, you know, throw them some coins. But then the master says, go outside the city. Take the highways out. You see, the people who lived outside of the city, not only did they not consider themselves a part of the community anymore, not a part of Israel anymore, these were the people who were so filled with sin and shame that they wouldn't show their face in town. These were the people who weren't allowed to enter into the temple, which was not only the seat of religious exercise, it was also the center of their community. These were the people that everyone was convinced were not just forgotten by their people, but were actually forgotten by God themselves. To get them to the banquet, you got to compel them. First, you just have to get them to show their face in the city. It's a crazy story and one that the Pharisees would have really had to wrestle with. Honestly, it would have been quite offensive of a story for Jesus to tell. Finally, Jesus is going to start making his point quite clear, and he does so grammatically by changing from third person to first person. So the whole parable has been in third person about the wealthy man, the master who threw a banquet for the people, and now Jesus is going to move to the first person. He says in verse 24, for I tell you, not one of these people who are invited will enjoy whose banquet? My banquet. All of a sudden. This isn't a simple parable to teach like an earthly good lesson. This is now Jesus claiming to be the king of the eternal banquet that is coming at the resurrection of the righteous. Here's the meaning of the parable. All the way at the beginning of the Jewish scripture, what we call the book of Genesis, God calls one nation. And the call is like, be my chosen people. The God of the universe who spoke it all into creation be my people, special and set apart to me. Join in with all I have, including all my glory and all my wonder, and live forever in my eternal kingdom. The invitation of a lifetime. And of course, check yes. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, down to Moses and Joshua and King David. Everyone's like, we're in. We are your people, set apart for your purposes. One day, sitting at the eternal banquet with God himself. We're in. That's the first invitation. 
And then God sent Jesus to earth. And do you remember the invitation that Jesus made when he came? Hear, O Israel, the kingdom of God is at hand. Preparation has been made, and you are the first of those invited in. However, you've bought a lie that it is your works that will make you right with my Father. And I tell you, if you want to see your eternal life, you must believe in the Son of God. The second invitation comes, and the same nation who checked yes to the RSVP rejects Jesus. Now think about when Jesus was on earth, if you've read the gospel stories or maybe you've seen it portrayed in a show like The Chosen, who was it that actually followed him in Israel? The outcasts, the poor, the blind, the maimed, the lame, the stepped over and left behind. Those were the ones who threw aside their tradition and put their faith in the Son of God. And Jesus comes to earth, lives the perfect life, dies the death that we deserve, defeats death itself, and right before he ascends, what does he say? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem. Okay, that's Israel. And in Judea. Okay, that's Israel. And in Samaria. Oh, that's like half of Israel, right? And outside of the city and the highways and the hedges to the people that you believe not only are forgotten by you, but forgotten by God to the ends of the earth, the Gentiles, people like me and you. The parable brings us all the way to today. And you see this all throughout the early church, that Jesus and his movement went out to the broken, the confused, the sinful, the worthless, the overlooked, the passed up, the shamed. Jesus said while he was on earth, I have not come to call the righteous or those who think they're righteous. I have come to call sinners to repentance. Jesus didn't seek his own honor. He sought the honor of his father. He came as a messenger to invite us all to the great eternal banquet. There's a famous scripture that says, we love Christ because Christ first loved us. And I think in the same way, we are called to invite others because Christ first invited us. And some of you know this very well because you can remember very clearly where you were when you met Jesus. Some of you remember your emotional state, your mental state, the state of your habits and addictions, your relationships, your finances. You remember being in the pit of despair and gripped by depression on the edge of your sanity. I had a plan for my life. And it was a, a bit of a reciprocal plan. I had done a little bit of networking, and I thought I knew how my life would play out, and things were actually kind of lining up for it. And the, the details don't matter all that much, but I was going to live for myself and my own fame and status and hopefully stack up a lot of money and have all the relationships that I wanted. And I was miserable. And I remember where I was when God met me. I was falling into a depression, I was trying to cope with drugs and alcohol. I was abusing pornography because I had no sense of myself and was deeply insecure. I grew up knowing who God was and believing in Jesus, but I was running from Jesus as far and as fast as I could. I became so depressed, I wanted to quit everything. I just wanted to give up. And it was then I prayed my first ever honest prayer. And I just said, Jesus, I'm not stopping. I've tried. I don't know how. So if you want me, you got to come get me. It's amazing what Jesus can do with a really honest prayer. 
the trajectory of my life was changed. And the reason that I want to spend all of my time and all of my energy for however many years God gives me on earth, inviting as many people in to experience what I've experienced in Jesus is because he first met me and invited me. And I realized that the further and faster I ran, the further and faster he followed after me, compelling me, persuading me, begging me. There's a better life for you if you'll just accept my invitation and come into this family. He invited me so I can invite you. And you've been invited to now go and invite somebody else. That is how the movement moves. The Apostle Paul experienced this as well, which by the way, when God met and invited the Apostle Paul, he was out there imprisoning other Christians. Makes me feel a little bit better about where I was at when Jesus met me. That's besides my. In 2 Corinthians 5, here's what Paul says In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And Christ has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Paul is making this very high level statement about the work Jesus did on earth. And the work Jesus did was reconciling us, which means bringing us from a state of enemies into friends with God, reconciling us. And then he says, and now the very work Jesus did was given to us to do as well. Therefore, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ because God is making his appeal through us so we plead on Christ's behalf. We plead. We compel others. We persuade others. If we need to, we get on our knees. We beg others. Be reconciled to God. Last week, we talked a little bit about spiritual gifts and how God has given his people in his church unique gifts and unique talents, which means your spiritual gift might not be your spiritual gift. It takes all of us because we're the body of Christ and we all play a function. And I think somewhere along the way, we got it in our mind that the ministry of invitation, what Paul's calling the ministry of reconciliation, that that's also like a unique spiritual gift. And some people have it and some people don't. But that's not what scripture says. You have some unique gifts. We also have some corporate callings. And Paul says, Jesus was reconciling us and now has given us corporately the ministry of reconciliation. Here's what we believe at Meta Church. We are all called to invite others. And some of you are like, yeah, man, I mean, I'm really, I'm really good at like holding the babies and meta kids. I do that. That's kind of my gift. You know, other people do the invitation. You know, we've got the extroverts out there on the welcome team. You know, we got them out there. I'm an introvert. And so the extroverts can invite. And then, you know, I don't care what you want me to do. I'll wash their feet if you want me to. But I, they'll do the inviting and then I'll make. We all are called to invite others. And the reason is because you are unique. Created by God on purpose. And with purpose. And only you hold the exact place in this world that you hold. Only you have your exact unique circle of influence that God has given you. And whether your circle of influence is two people or whether it's 2,000 people, God has placed you on earth and he's put people around you. And either that's all just kind of accidental or God has positioned you with divine appointments all around you. And I think that often... We lack in the ministry of invitation because we lose focus on what it took for Jesus to invite us in. And we invite others because Christ first invited us. Imagine if we all took up our role given to us by Christ to be as ambassadors and to begin inviting people around us. Uh, we're growing. You look around, there's not a ton of seats, you know, unless we're going to all go shoulder to shoulder. I can't wait for y'all all to be shoulder to shoulder one of these days, but I know you don't want to be shoulder to shoulder, but the Holy Spirit might want you to be shoulder to shoulder. So you just got to get those shoulders ready because I think it's coming, you know, and, and like, please make us open a fourth service, please. 
We do whatever it takes. We're, we're going to open a whole other location later this year. And then three or four after that, just in the city. And so we're going to start a six-week initiative called The Great Invite. I, I grew up in athletics. And so I'm just a big believer. If you want to learn something, you got to practice. And you got to have repetition. And so I'm going to walk you through a template for how to invite people. Very simple. It takes courage, but it's very simple. And we're going to practice. And two things about Easter invite that we're not going to do. Number one is we're not going to wait for Easter to invite people to Easter. Um, we're going to invite people to the next Sunday starting now. And I can tell you this. The best way to get someone to Easter service is to get them to a service before Easter. Where they've already experienced the culture. They already know they're welcome. They already know how to check their kids in. They already know the parking lot. They've already seen the whole deal. And they feel comfortable to come to Easter. Second thing we're not going to do. Every year, we print you guys out Easter invite cards. And I'm not pointing at anybody because you probably did it the right way. But I think the danger is we pin them on the board at work. And we went... I invited someone, actually I invited everybody. I put it on the bulletin board with a thousand other pieces of crap up there, you know, like I invited them. Or you just kind of slide it on someone's desk so no one sees it, you know, like did it, invited, invited her, <laughs> nailed it. And it takes out the personal. And if you want someone to actually come, it has to be a personal ask. And so I'm going I'm to teach you three step, very, very simple. Number one, you ask if they have a church. Now, Try to make this in the flow of conversation. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you just walk into an office, hey, you got a church, you're going to, you know, freak somebody out. <laughs> but if your eyes are open to divine appointments, you're going to have endless opportunities to do this. Because what do you talk to people about? What you're doing that weekend? What you're up to? What your hobbies are? What your kids are involved in? All of those are open doors. I would just ask it like this. This is how I ask it. Hey, do you have a church? Now, the first thing that happens when you ask that question, all the pressure's off. Because when you say, hey, do you have a church? Guess what? They know you're about to invite them to your church, okay? Like, they know from that moment forward what's happening. So, so you've done it. And that's going to be the hardest part, is just getting those words out. I promise you, the Holy Spirit's going to be prompting you in a conversation with a coworker or someone at the gym or the person who's, you know, ringing you up at Starbucks. The Holy Spirit's going to prompt you to be like, do you have, and it's just, it's going to be right here like, hey, do you have a church? <laughs> and they're going to call 911. They're going to think you're having an issue. But the fifth time, you're going to be practiced. And they're going to be like, yeah, man, my kids, I don't know what's going on with them. I, don't know, I can't get them under control. And it's just going to be like, boom. hey, do you have a church? Man, we got a youth program. We got a kids program. Number one, ask if they have a church. Two things will happen. Number one, they'll say yes. And then praise God. And I know y'all, y'all are a competitive bunch, right? So we're not going to try to steal anybody from their spot, okay? We just say, praise God, you know? Um, you have a church? Yeah, I actually go over here. Oh, I've heard great things. That's so cool. And the Holy Spirit might, as a bonus, if they have a church, convict them. Not you. You're not convicting them. The Holy Spirit might be like, dang, Clayton is out here inviting people to church. Why am I not out here inviting people to my church, you know? And then the whole church grows, and God gets the glory. Or they'll say no. And usually they won't say N-O. Usually they'll say, ah, oh, man, I went when I was a kid, but it was weird. You know. <laughs> uh, I went for a while, but I don't know. I don't really buy it. Uh, we haven't been going since COVID. We were kind of involved, and then COVID, you know, out of rhythm. I went to church, but I don't know. I just got hurt. Everybody's fake, you know. It's an open door. Uh, I, you know, I'm not really a church. What I hear more than, than anything is, oh, I'm not a church person, you know. I walk into the church, man, the whole thing's going to catch on fire. That's what I hear all the time, you know. I mean, they don't know when they say that, that's a lob right over home plate. I'm not really a church person. Oh, good. We have 700 of those. <laughs> I'm not really like a churchy. Yeah, neither is our pastor. Come on out, you know. <laughs> Do you have a church? Number two, tell your story briefly. Introverts, I'm not worried about you. Extroverts, briefly. <laughs> um, if you don't, you need to develop a two-sentence testimony. A two-sentence testimony. 
Do you have a church? Uh, I haven't been in a long time. Uh, I don't really know, man. Church, church is kind of weird. I thought that too, you know. And I, I had no peace in my life. And I started going to a place called Meta Church on the west side. And I don't know. I, I just have so much peace in my life. If that's your story, tell your story. You know, um, my, my wife and I, we were just, I don't know, we, we didn't hate each other. It was just weird, you know. We're in this faith community now, and we found a purpose, and our marriage is just better than ever. What's your two-second testimony? Two-sentence testimony. Get it out fast. All they, all they need to see is some proof of concept. Most of the time they get invited to church, it's like this. Hey, you seem like a sinner. You should come to church, you know. <laughs> And they're like, well, <laughs> thanks but no thanks, you know? <laughs> they just need a little proof of concept. Like there, like there is a local church that's actually effective in someone normal's life. Like I've worked with you for 10 years, and you're, I know you're somewhat normal, and it's helping you. So do you have a church? No. Two-second testimony. And then you're going to invite them to sit with you. That Sunday. Be specific. Um, if you do the first two and then just say, you should come to my church, they're never coming. The odds of someone attending a church Sunday service, if they have someone who will meet them in the parking lot and walk them through the steps, it, it rises exponentially. And so those are the three steps, and it's really simple. And you're either going to get so consumed with the pain and worries of, of Monday through Saturday that next Sunday we're going to remind you we're in the great invite, we're inviting people. Jesus invited us to the banquet, so you need to invite people to the banquet as well. You're going to be like, dang, I didn't do that at all, and I never saw any opportunities. Or you're going to ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and allow room for him to prompt your soul. And you'll be shocked how many conversations you're in. For the people of God, every situation is a divine appointment. When you go to H-E-B, when you go get your oil checked, I'm just going to tell you this. I'm not a prophet, but in Jesus' name, at least five of you need your oil changed right now. One of them is my wife, okay? Y'all need your oil changed? <laughs> and y'all all live in it. So, so as you're in there and you roll your window down and it's awkward and, and they're doing this, that, and the other, watch. They'll be like, what you up to this weekend? And you just say, oh, man, you know, I'm, I'm chilling. Hit my church on Sunday. Do you have a church? Watch, and then you'll invite them, and they won't come, all right? And then next week, someone else will pull into that same bay in that same oil change and say, do you have a church? And they'll be like, dang, there's a lot of people that met a church around this area. And eventually, it might, it might be three years from now, they show up. This is too important for us to get wrong because too many of you know the power of a simple invite that got you here. Where God was able to change your life. We invite others because Christ first invited us. The banquet is set. And Jesus is ready. And he has called the whole world. Especially those that everyone has passed up. Stepped over. The outcast. And the marginalized. Would you pray with me? If you would bow your head and close your eyes. Nothing magic about that. Just create some space for yourself. For the people around you. I want to start just by wondering if there's anyone who's here today or anyone watching online who has never accepted Jesus' invitation to eternal life. Maybe you've heard about the gospel. You're aware of the story that Jesus died and that paid for your sin that separates you from God. That he rose again three days later, defeating death itself. You're aware of all that. You have the knowledge. But you've never put your faith in Jesus. And maybe it's because you grew up under this false belief, like the Pharisees. That it's your job to work your way to God. So you're just hoping that if you do enough good and give enough to charity and have enough kind of religious exercise in your life that maybe that will tip the scales someday. Jesus came to put that belief to death. He said, 
anyone who just simply believes in me will have eternal life. Maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus because you live so far outside of the city. You feel marginalized and outcast because of your own choices, because of the sin in your life and the pain that you've caused. And you needed to be reminded that Jesus came, not for the righteous, but to give his life away to reach those furthest from God. So if you're here today and you've never had that moment of receiving eternal life by simply believing in Jesus, I want to ask you with everyone's eyes closed for just a moment of courage if you would slip your hand up in the air saying, I am ready to put my faith in Jesus today. If right now you would put your hand in the air where I can see you, amen. Amen. God is at work. He is at work in this movement. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna ask everyone who put their hand up as well as all the believers in the room to pray this prayer, very simple prayer, just acknowledging our faith. Let's pray like this. Jesus, today I choose to put my faith in you. I believe you are God, that you came to earth, that you died on a cross, and I believe you rose again. I thank you for loving me and for a new eternal life. Let me pray over you. Jesus, what you're doing in this place is just unreal. It's a reminder of why we must pick up our responsibility, the ministry of invitation, calling others to come and see to come and experience what you can do in our lives. We rejoice with you, God, along with all of heaven for lives who have come home and are made new. And I pray they would just jump in with both feet and see all that you have for them in this new walk. We love you. And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand for what he keeps doing here. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We hope it was encouraging to you. If God is using our online ministry to impact your life in some way, we would love to know about it. You can send stories to info at metachurch.tv. Email us and man, we can come alongside you and celebrate with you. Also, if you wanna give to this movement to not just keep it going, but to keep it growing, you can become a contributor online by going to metachurch.tv and clicking the give button. There you can give one time or you can set up a recurring gift and become a consistent giver to what God is doing through MetaChurch. Also, if you're in the San Antonio area, I wanna invite you to come to a service live. We would love to meet you in person and for you to experience all that God is doing in this movement. We love you and we hope to see you streaming with us next week.